All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Welcome to our third event of the semester in the new Perspectives in Civil War Era History Speaker Series. Uh, we've had two speakers before now, myself and Dr. Jonathan Jones. Uh, and before I introduce our third speaker, who I'm very excited to have here tonight, I uh, just wanted to let you all know that we have some upcoming events as well in the spring semester. Uh, we'll be doing uh, some more speakers for the new Perspectives in Civil War era history throughout the spring, so keep an eye out for those. Uh, and additionally, we will be hosting several Civil War weekends throughout the spring, uh, particularly in March 2021, uh, which will be really, really fascinating and exciting. The theme for that will be resources at war uh, or for war. And so I encourage you to keep an eye out on the mailing list. Uh, I'd like to remind you all that we have uh, several sources for checking in on new events and seeing what the center is up to. We have the website, uh, civilwar.vt.edu, uh, and then we have the Twitter page, uh, which is available, obviously, on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, so you can reach us in several different venues. This event will also be posted on C-SPAN uh, in just a few weeks, so keep an eye out for that. We'll be posting about that on Twitter and Facebook as well, uh, and I just really look forward to sharing this uh, with all of you tonight. This is a really exciting topic. Um, I should introduce myself as well. My name is Dr. Caroline Wood Newhall. I'm currently the postdoctoral fellow here at the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies, uh, along with the director, Dr. Paul Quigley. And I'd like to introduce, without further ado, uh, our speaker for tonight, Dr. Adam Dombey. Now, Dr. Dombey, I'm very excited to have here with us tonight. He's an award-winning historian of the Civil War reconstruction in the American South. He's also an assistant professor at the College of Charleston, uh, and he'll be speaking tonight a little bit about his book, The False Cause, Fraud, Fabrication, and White Supremacy in Confederate Memory, which can be ordered from any of your favorite booksellers. Uh, so in addition to Civil War memory, lies, white supremacy, Dr. Dombey has also written about prisoners of war, guerrilla warfare, reconstruction, divided communities, and public history. So we'll be getting a little bit of all of that tonight, which I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about. Uh, he'll be talking about lost cause myths, legends, and falsehoods, as well as the creation of Confederate monuments. Uh, and in examining tall tales, Dr. Dombey will expose how white supremacy has long been connected to narratives about the past. Uh, just as a quick reminder, we do have closed captions available for any of you who need it. And please feel free to use the Q&A function throughout the talk and start asking questions, which we'll get to at the end of the discussion. We'll have maybe 15 to 20 minutes to get through some of those. So without further ado, I'd like to to introduce Dr. Adam Dombey. Thank you so much and look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here uh, with all of you and uh, a, a big fan of the, the center you guys have at Virginia Tech. And so thank you for having me. And, and I, I'm really excited that we have so many people here tonight uh, to hear about what I believe is a really important topic, which is the lost cause. And we're going to define that in a minute, but I want to just reiterate sort of what, how I came, how, why I'm here um, and, and why I got invited is I'm, I am the author of a, a book, The False Cause, Fraud, Fabrication, White Supremacy and Confederate Memory. And uh, its premise is that not only do we selectively remember the past, not only do we selectively forget the past, um, which we, we all, I think, know, we also just make stuff up. Uh, we, we literally just make up lies uh, as a society to understand the past, the way we remember the past, as opposed to the way historians do uh, understand the past, which is through rigorous research uh, and, and sort of critical analysis. And so my research looks at these, the, the ties between lies and white supremacy and historical memory. And it's the book looks at everything from pension fraud to made up stories about deserters who deserted for love of their, their wives to myths more recently of black Confederates, which just to be clear, did not exist. There were not black Confederates. The Confederate military did not allow African-Americans to serve. Uh, it was illegal until March of 1865 under Confederate law, but there is, a myth that has, has been propagated for a variety of reasons. Um, and so the book looks at that as well. And the book though, 
And what's gotten the book the most attention, I think, is the fact that the book also looks at Confederate monuments. And Confederate monuments are a topic that is front and center right now. And one of the easiest ways to understand what these monuments were meant to do is to actually look at the dedications, the, the literal moments when they put them up, at the individuals who put them up, and see how they understood the these monuments. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so you guys can hopefully, if this goes well, see. So we're gonna start today. Um, can you guys see, is that got the right screen? Uh, Caroline, yes. just make sure. It, <laughs> all right, yeah. excellent. So what we have here is um, just a few pictures from monument dedications. And monument dedications are sort of a key, as I mentioned, key moment when we can get at what the originals of these monuments wanted remembered. And so we're gonna examine these moments tonight as a group. But before we get into the examples I wanna talk about, I wanna talk about the examples you guys can look at. Because one of the great things about the internet is it's now much easier to do historical research. And you can actually do research yourselves onto a lot of these topics. And so you can actually very easily with things like newspapers.com, go and look up the, the your local dedication and see what was said at your dedication, um, which is a lot of fun. And so, Sorry about that, making sure this works. So we're gonna use one example tonight. We're gonna use the example of Julian Carr, who, sorry about that. We're gonna use the example of Julian Carr, who called himself a general, uh, though he had served as a private during the war. He earned his general stars, which you can see on these uniforms, not through military service, but actually uh, because he was the head of Confederate veterans. And, and this is sort of one of the many sort of myths that is propagated, right? That he presents himself as a general when in fact he was a private. Um, and so he, he wears all this regalia that he was actually not entitled to by the terms of military service, but through veterans organizations. And so you could see already, but who was Julian Carr and why Julian Carr? We're gonna use Julian Carr. We could use a variety of different historians. Carr is not a household name um, right now usually, but Carr was a North Carolinian industrialist. He was a major philanthropist. At one point, he was probably the richest man in North Carolina. He was the namesake of Carborough, North Carolina, which uh, is near and dear to my heart as I lived there for many years. He was better private, as I mentioned, the head of the United Confederate Veterans. So this was the sort of key veterans organization for Confederate veterans, he's the top guy. And so when he says something, it's representative of what those who elected him wanted him to say. He was a white supremacist. He considered himself a conservative. He was a Democratic Party leader. And he was perhaps the most prolific public speaker at Confederate monument dedications, at least in North Carolina, if not everywhere. I mean, he is always at dedications. If you look at his day planner, or you look at newspaper articles, you're always finding Julian Carr, front and center, giving a speech. And his speeches are preserved at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. They have a bunch of his speeches in, and it's actually these speeches that led me to this project. But he also felt fun monuments. And so he's so central in this monument building movement that I think it's worth focusing on him as our key example. And you can see him here in, as he was one of the leading speakers, this is at the dedication of the Unity Monument, um, and you can see him there in the center speaking in his Confederate uniform. And though through these speeches and fundraising, raising, he was a leading propagator of the lost cause. And his mission was to recall the war in a specific way, which frequently overlapped with his goals around his political views. With, and he was very explicit that these monuments were meant to celebrate white supremacy. Um, during these speeches, he would say as much. So it's not a secret. 
Now, I keep mentioning the lost cause. What do I mean by the lost cause? The lost cause is the narrative that Carr and others wanted recalled. And as I mentioned, I could do this with other people, but Carr, Carr sort of exemplifies it. And no person has exactly the same understanding of the past, right? Dr. Newhall and I do not always agree on every little aspect of the past. But when it comes to public memory, there are certain things that tend to show up again and again. Things that are sort of key, central key tenets we see again and again that are, are sort of central to what Carr wanted remembered and what want others wanted. So for the lost cause, the lost cause is this narrative. It's a way of recalling the past. And it was propagated by Confederate veterans and their allies, especially their wives and daughters, that focuses on noble Confederates fighting for a worthwhile cause. And so I want to just sort of talk about some of these basic tenets, the basic lost cause narrative falsehoods, because I sometimes refer to it as the false cause. And we'll talk about each element in turn, but I want to just cover them so you're aware of them all. And here are the sort of four claims that we're going to deal with. The first is that slavery was not the cause of the war. The second is that slavery was benevolent. The third understanding was actually not about the war so much as about Reconstruction, which argued that Reconstruction disrupted antebellum race relations and was a corrupt period of misrule. And finally, the most valiant and dedicated soldiers of all, all time. Now we'll start with that first one and we'll work our way through because the first one is perhaps the easiest, but it's also perhaps the most important. Um, and so when we see these sort of four key lies, which we have on the screen right now, um, slavery not being the cause of the war, slavery being benevolent, Reconstruction disrupting happy race relations and being a corrupt period of misrule, and finally Confederates being the most dedicated soldiers. That slavery was not the cause of the war is the one I run into the most still, and the one that I think is most problematic. And let me be very clear, it's perhaps the easiest to debunk. The war was about slavery. Mississippi made it quite clear when they seceded. They said, it is but just, this is in the Mississippi secession documents, they said, it is but just that we should declare the prominent reasons which have induced our course. In other words, here's why we're doing this. It's literally a document explaining why they wanted to leave. It's a list of complaints. And then they said, after they said, here's our reason, they said, the first thing they say is, our position is thoroughly identified with slavery the greatest material interest in the world. And then they proceed to go on and list all the ways slavery was threatened. That it's, slavery, it's threatened not because it's not being allowed to expand. It's threatened by the Lincoln administration. It's threatened by potential slave insurrection, people like John Brown. And it goes on and on listing all the threats to slavery. And then it ends. There's no mention of a tariff, no mention of taxes. They actually complain about there being too much states' rights because the fugitive slave isn't being enforced. And so that's the really the only mention that Mississippi makes of the Fugitive Slave Act, or of federal law, ignoring federal law, states' rights, is they're complaining about too much states' rights. And so historians today really do agree that slavery was central to the war. They may disagree which aspect of slavery was central to the war. Was it slavery? Was it the threat of slave insurrection that motivated people? But slavery was fundamentally. But why change the cause? Why remember the war differently? Was it embarrassment about fighting for a bad cause? I mean, now you might think it is. And it's truth, it has become partly that. One of the reasons that I has held on, I think, but it's not exactly the main reason. Because as noted earlier, they argued slavery was benevolent simultaneously. At the same time that they're saying it wasn't slavery, they're like, yeah, but slavery was good. Uh, follow the logic with me for a minute that Confederates after the war put forward. If you fought for states' rights, you hadn't really lost. If you fought for slavery, you're a loser. It's that simple, right? Now, in time, this denial begins serving a second purpose of avoiding being tied, of avoiding tying the Confederacy to something morally problematic. And surely that played some role as well. But in general, the Lost Clause proponents actually defended slavery. They claimed it was, again, benevolent. And so like other lost cause advocates, though, Julian Carr rewrote the cause of the war to portray himself as a winner. Now, this is actually a monument that un was unveiled um, in at Bennett Place, 
in North Carolina. It is the site of the largest surrender of Confederate troops in the entire war. So this is literally where they lost. And at this dedication speech for a monument there, Carr will say, we lost, but we won. And this is kind of absurd, right? Because um, what does that even mean? But what he's talking about is sort of two parts. One is he's claiming he wasn't a loser and that the principles which they fought for, whatever those may be, won out in the end, for instance, states' rights. And that they hadn't really lost. They found peace with honor, he says. Now, this is, of course, kind of um, ironic when you think about the fact that they're literally at the site of a surrender. And he's saying, we didn't really lose. There was another monument in North Carolina where at one of the dedications, another speaker said, Ap uh, sorry, Appomattox was not a surrender. It was a compromise. This would have surprised um, Robert E. Lee, of course, uh, who was pretty sure he surrendered at Appomattox. But this compromise supposedly was that slavery died, but states' rights were preserved because states' rights was a crucial way of upholding white supremacy during the Jim Crow era. It was a key fight against federal intervention. Now, I want to go back to this issue of slavery being very clear. Slavery is not benevolent, and you don't have to take my word for it. You can take the words of slaveholders. And here we have two advertisements that I'm going to give you a sec to look at. These are runaway uh, ads. These are ads for runaway slaves. And the first one on the left, if you noticed, you know, sometimes you'll hear people say, enslaved people were protected because they were valuable investments, so they were treated well. I'll give you Mr. Moore, who was a enslaver, and he said in this ad, I will give a reward of $25 for the delivery of Peter or $50 for his head. Now, I submit to you that Peter is not being returned alive, nor does Mr. Moore want Peter returned alive. He wants him returned dead. Now, the exact reason he wants this, unclear. But what's clear is that perhaps it's too intense, but it's clear he is not being protected by being valuable property. He is, in fact, a public statement. This is a public statement. This is normalized. He is not embarrassed that his neighbors will see this read in the newspaper, to be clear. Let's look at the other one, Mr. Ricks here, in which he is unsure of if this woman ran away or was stolen. And I submit to you she was probably a runaway because he says publicly in the newspaper that his neighbors will read, I burnt her with a hot iron on the left side of her face. I tried to make the letter M. He literally branded her slowly with a hot iron on her face. He didn't do a very good job. I tried to make the letter M. And suddenly she runs away a few days after. No surprise. Now, if you look even more carefully, you'll notice something here. And I should warn you, uh, when we talk about history, it gets upsetting. And what we're about to talk about uh, is going to get a little bit more upsetting. Uh, but as historians, we don't run away from violence. We don't run away from uh, accounts of rape or uh, unfortunate things. We have to run towards them. We have to analyze them. That's what we do as historians. But I do warn you, if you do have small children in the room, uh, what we're about to talk about is upsetting. Because if we look really carefully at this ad, you'll notice that she ran away with two boys. And one of them is described as both mixed race and with blue eyes. Um, which is in, an ind indicator that perhaps this woman who is described as darker skinned than her child had been raped. Um, and we know that rape was commonplace during slavery. We think of slavery as just a, a extraction of labor and it was. Uh, slavery is a system of extracting labor through violence, the threat of violence, the threat of family separation and terror. It really is premised upon terror. That's what makes it work. It's horrifying. There's really no defense of it. But it's also not just about money. Um, it's about power. And, and if you look uh, in, in the slave trade, you will see what's called the fancy girl trade, um, which are very light-skinned women who were described as very attractive 
uh, usually in their teens, and they were openly sold as sex slaves. This isn't openly done in the newspapers. This is in uh, the top one is in the Fayetteville newspaper. And the bottom one in this, this slide that you guys are looking at right now is from the New Orleans paper of record. And you'll notice that the most valuable slaves were frequently, not always, but frequently um, sex slaves. Um, and as young as 12 years old are being separated from their family and sold into sex slave openly. And this is in the newspaper. Again, that's slavery. And if you wanna learn more about slavery, I put up two books up there that are, are great books for those looking to have more information on the actual history of slavery and what it, what it really is. But it's safe to say slavery um, was not benevolent. Uh, we, can, we can sort of take that as fact. Now, Reconstruction disrupted antebellum race relations and was a period of, of misrule is another common lie. And again, I would say that this is probably not the best way to interpret it. Um, this was the way it was interpreted at the turn of the 20th century by many historians, not all, but the Dunning School at the turn of the 20th century were very pro propagate this as actual scholars by the same time that people remembered it this way publicly. Um, the reality of Reconstruction, again, was a time we can think of incredible progress. We often think of American history as an upward trajectory. Um, we're always going upwards towards more freedom, right? You have the Declaration of Independence and then the Constitution, and then you refine it with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. And then you get the 19th Amendment, makes it even better. And then you have the Civil Rights Movement, which sort of seals the deal. And we're just always going towards more freedom. But the truth of the matter is, sometimes we go back. Um, Reconstruction was a period where they had, there was universal male suffrage, which was then undone. You had a moment in time when African-Americans voted in overwhelming numbers across the South, where at least legally equal rights had been assured, where public education systems were founded in many Southern states for all. There were African-American elected representatives who then were pushed out of office. And by 1901, there are no more, at least in the federal Congress and it would be years until another was elected, right? So this backwards movement, the right to testify against your accuser. This was, these were things that, that everyone could do suddenly. And again, I put up some books there if you're looking for extra reading uh, for those who wanna know more about Reconstruction because I can't go too deeply into what Reconstruction was, but it's the period after the Civil War, it's enough to say. Now, how did these lies uphold slavery? Or sorry, white supremacy. How did they uphold white supremacy? Now, during the Jim Crow era, which is of course the early, late 19th, early 20th century we're talking about now, these lies justify white supremacy. They were used ideologically to justify white supremacy. If you believe the South had idyllic racial relations before the Civil War, and that enfranchising African-Americans caused bad race relations during Reconstru Reconstruction, what would fix it? returning a racial hierarchy. That was the logic being put forward by this ahistorical narrative. Under this ahistorical logic, the issue was not giving African-Americans the ballot. That did not cause the violence of white supremacy. It was, it was the, let me phrase this, the violence was caused by giving people the ballot, not by white supremacy. Reword that for a minute. Um, by the logic of this historical narrative, disenfranchisement wasn't a, a bad thing. It was fixing what was broken. Now, in reality, we know it was an oppressive system, right? We all know that. But part of what the lost cause was doing is it was celebrating overturning the war's outcome. The 14th and 15th Amendment had essentially been overturned. If the 14th Amendment had been actually enforced, Southern states would have lost house seats due to the second section of it. Now, the 14th and 15th Amendment were seen by lost cause advocates as a mistake. In fact, Julian Carr, while in Manila, no less. So he's out in the Philippines, but tells a crowd about Reconstruction in 1960. Now, take it from a Confederate soldier, the five years succeeding 1865 to 1870 were more horrible than four years of bloody war. Now, 
Though he was speaking in the Philippines, far from home, Carr was still celebrating this notion that white North Carolinians had made the world better by disenfranchising their African-American neighbors. And he went on to then celebrate that North Carolina said, quote, and this is a quote, kept untarnished the un and unpolluted the red blood of the Anglo-Saxon. So to him, these monuments are not only training, changing losers into victors, but they're celebrating not just the war, but overturning the outcome of the war, the overturn of the war's outcome. And again, as we see this, these overturning of the gains, they're saying this openly. Um, and by saying that it's about states' rights at the same time, you then uphold states' rights as this key element in Southern society, which is then used again to fight back against federal intervention. At a Union County dedication in North Carolina, one speaker declared that the 15th Amendment was the most colossal, colossal blunder and crime in the history of the world, and he celebrated it being overturned as they dedicated a monument. This was common, right? This overturning of gains by African Americans at monument dedications can be seen again and again and again. And we're going to look at one more, and we're going to look at it explicitly. Um, the dedication of UNC's Chapel Hill Monument, which some of you may be familiar with by now. And this is the speech that got me uh, into this topic. This is the speech that, that led me to write this book. I was not supposed to write this book. Um, I was supposed to write a different book on guerrilla warfare, but I decided that this book was needed. Um, and in many ways, it was what played out in front of me that led me to realize this. And it's like all dedications started with somebody giving the monument to the veterans and there's a series of speeches and celebrations and here you can see a photograph of it. And then they had a Confederate veteran speak and it was Julian Carr. And he does this typical speech. He talks about how many soldiers went to fight and how valiant they were and how devoted they were and the nobility of their fighting. And he talked about how they volunteered. And then he turned what he thought the monument would teach future generations. Now this was a monument on a college campus. So it was aimed clearly at future generations. And he said the monument was about the success of overturning reconstruction. And then said, let me tell you what I did. He didn't just say, I help that we preserve the Anglo-Saxon race during reconstruction by overturning it. But he said that as well. He then says, let me tell you what I did. Let me tell you my part. And then he relates how he horse whipped, and in his word, I'll quote, a Negro wench until her skirts hung in shreds, end quote. That's what he did. Not an embarrassed statement. This is a statement of pride that he's given and that he sees as tied to this monument's dedication. He was proud of doing this. And we often think about racism, about being hatred, but it wasn't, it's about power and social order being maintained. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Carr never says he hated this woman. And did he consider himself a friend of the black community? And at the same time as he, he considered himself a friend of the black community, he was a proud Klan member. And so this is a worthwhile takeaway if you take nothing else away that racism and white supremacy don't require hatred. It's about power, opportunity, privilege, social order, and inequality. Those are the key elements necessary. Is hatred part of it or propagated by it? Yes. Does it help motivate it? Yes, but it's not required. It's created in many ways by these elements. Uh, and Carr was quite proud of his violence. Uh, he not only told about this assault on the unnamed woman, we don't know her name yet, although research does continue on that. He announced in 1921 he had been a member of the original Klan. And in 1923, he announced he'd been a member of the Klan. So he was quite open about his part uh, in Klan violence and Klan participation. Oops, sorry. And as I mentioned, Carr saw himself as a friend of African-Americans. 
he was considered a moderate many. Now, he's only a moderate if we ignore the existence of non-white supremacists he campaigned against. If we ignore the presence of Republicans and African-Americans who were running for office, he was a moderate in the Democratic Party of 1900. This is before the party realignment of the 20th century. But he would lay out these issues as that he was a friend of African-Americans so long as they maintained their place. He would give money to African-American charities. But again, it was a friendship based on accepting racial order, on accepting a power dynamic where he had power because he had money, but it wasn't based on hatred. Um, it was based on maintaining the color line. And to him, that was more important than a black person's life. And he would routinely defend things like lynching. Uh, now, I want to turn for a second to his most famous political campaign. In 1900, he ran for the Senate. Julian Carr runs for Senate, and he would tie his lost cause memory to white supremacy and to running for office. Um, he used his time as a Confederate soldier to argue he was the biggest champion of white supremacy. Uh, and he tried to out racist the other racists. Uh, he was running against Alfred Waddell and Fernald Simmons. Uh, again, before the party realignment during the 20th, 20th, in the 20th century, the conservative party was the Democratic Party. And being labeled a white supremacist wasn't a problem. It was a requirement for election in North Carolina. And one way to see party realignment uh, is seeing how white supremacy is viewed um, and how ballot access was viewed. The 1900 campaign, a key issue was disenfranchising African-Americans. That was the goal of the Democratic Party that year. And Carr and other Democrats were, were successful in the end in disenfranchising African-Americans. But ultimately, Carr fails to win the Senate seat. Why? He wasn't racist enough. Carr ran on the motto, the white man shall rule or die. I mean, he was not pretending he wasn't racist. But Alfred Waddell and Fernifold Simmons had overseen the Wilmington race massacre and the disenfranchisement of black voters and were seen as more racist. And they campaigned and won the white supremacist vote, leading Carr to lose. Now, to wrap it up, I want to end on that final element I mentioned earlier. Why do Americans believe Confederates fought so well? After all, they lost in just four years. Um, why would we recall them as such great soldiers? I mean, the United States military in 1860 was about 16,000 men. That's tiny. And they would have to expand that military by orders of magnitude. And that takes time to do. Um, now, perhaps one of the reason the Confederates are remembered as the greatest soldiers since Thermopylae is because they told us so. And in doing so, they made themselves out to be exemplars of manhood, thus claiming they deserve the ballot. Indeed, one of the claims of this book argues is that claims that, Afri that Confederates fought better than anyone else were fundamental to upholding white supremacy. And during that campaign of 1900, Carr put forward the fact that, again, he was a Confederate veteran. And in one of his campaign advertisements, it said, it claimed that Carr had spent three years in the trenches, in the dark days of 1862, 63, and 64. Now, the problem was this is that Julian Carr did not spend three years in the trenches. Um, and so his military service suddenly came under light. Now this was, the attacks on his military ref record, to be clear, were not John Kerry and the Swift Boat veterans made up stuff. These attacks were actually quite legitimate. It turns out we actually have records of his military service. He did not serve three years in the Confederate service. He had a deferment because he was in college. and we actually have the documents. We can actually find the documents. And so what we find is that he had this deferment. And then when that deferment finally runs out, he gets assigned to the conscript bureau and helps conscript others, force others. So when he would present white Southerners as all volunteering, he knew better because he forced people to go fight. In fact, he himself was a conscript. And 
when he finally, the conscript bureau realizes that they're not getting any more men, they send all those working on the conscript bureau off to fight themselves. He ends up at the front and he gets made a messenger. And so we actually don't even know if he fought at all. Uh, we know, we don't know if he fought well. He may have. Uh, we know he didn't fight long though. And we know he didn't volunteer despite often telling us he did. So he was stretching the truth at the very least of his own military service. So did Confederate soldiers fight better than any other soldiers ever? Uh, this is a fundamental question that I often get asked. And the answer is I don't know yet, um, to be honest. And I think it's worth acknowledging when we don't know something. They certainly were not as uniformly devoted as some historians still depict them. And it seems that at least part of the reason we think that they're so devoted is early 20th century racial politics. This memory that all whites supported the Confederacy uniformly provided a historical narrative where whites voted as a block, where all whites would vote together. It justified whites voting a certain way. It was also used to justify disenfranchisement with claims that white men had earned the vote by showing their valor as Confederates, while black men had not, despite the fact that thousands, in fact, over 100,000, African-American Southerners had fought for the United States military. Again and again, though, literacy requirements that were only for African-Americans due to the grandfather clause were held up as justified because white men had proven themselves already during the Civil War, once again, ignoring black Southerners. But when did facts ever stop a good story that was useful politically? And so it was used to justify terrible things through lies. And so I could give an entire talk about how we recall the Confederate war effort and different Confederate, com Confederate commanders. We don't have time to do all of that. So what I want to sort of remind you is we have a lot to find out still. We need a reassessment of the Confederate soldier. And if you want to know more about how Confederate soldiers were misremembered, you can buy my book. Um, and for those wanting other books to read about the lost cause memory, I just want to close by just sort of giving a quick shout out as a few good places to start. In addition to my own book, Carolyn Janney's Remembering the Civil War, David Blight's Race and Reunion, and Karen Cox Dixie's Daughters, all do an excellent job explaining how lost cause memory functioned along with other forms of memory as well. Because it's worth noting, lost cause memory was the memory of white Southerners. There's an entirely other memory that African-Americans have of the war. There's an entire other memory that Northern whites and one of the things the book talks about is there's actually a memory of white Southern Unionists that largely is erased, but is worth remembering as well. And, and the book talks quite a bit about that in chapter three. But I'll close there for questions and I'll be happy to take any questions. And I know that uh, Dr. Newhall has um, probably gone through them and has some to ask. Yes, I do. Thank you so much, Adam. That was wonderful. <clears throat> All right, so we definitely have some questions that I think really hearken to some of the things that you were talking about throughout uh, this lecture. And I'll start with one, which is um, you know, that idea that not all white people in the South were uniformly committed to the cause, right, to the, to the Confederacy. So there's one particular question about uh, Western North Carolina exhibiting quite a bit of support for the Union during the Civil War. Uh, so the question centers on was white supremacy also exhibited there as well? Um, do we see these kind of similar commemoration efforts even though there is support for the Union? Yeah, this is a great question. And I, I would actually say it's not just Western North Carolina. Uh, we all know Western North Carolina, the, the Appalachian Mountains, people always focus on that. There's a small population of African-Americans, less slaveholders. So it's, it's a place where people assume will be right for unionism, and indeed it is. There's plenty of dissent, if not unionism, and I want to draw a distinction here because I think it's worth remembering. Uh, there are those who oppose the Confederacy just because they don't want to go to war and conscription pisses them off, or um, that they think the best way to maintain slavery is to stay in the union. Um, there's a lot of reasons why someone might not support the Confederacy and they're everywhere. Um, there are somewhere in the order of, uh, of 100,000, if I remember correctly, um, white Southerners who serve in the United States military. Now to give you some scale on that, that's bigger than the Army of Northern Virginia ever was at one time. 
And that's a massive shift of manpower when you think about it. Um, and so the, the shift in manpower um, is important to the war, but it's, it's everywhere. And one of the things the book talks about is it talks about the way um, that there was a memory for a time of principled unionism. And indeed, if you look at during the Reconstruction era, there are these, these whole political campaigns to get the unionist vote where people are trying to appeal saying, I didn't treat deserters badly. I didn't treat conscripts badly. The other guy did vote for me. And ultimately um, that memory, which was premised actually on sort of being opposed to your neighbors, right? If you're a unionist who resists the Confederacy due to principles, somebody has to be pushing back against you. And so it's a problematic memory because it maintains divisions within the white community. And so the lost cause is used to paper over it. And one of the things the book talks about is the ways that you can lure people, so to speak, into rejecting their own past, their own experience. And you can have an individual, for instance, who avoided conscription as long as he could, was captured by Confederate soldiers and forced into the military. And after one month in the Confederate military, deserted, went home, took up arms when Confederate soldiers showed up to arrest him and to fight back, and then fled to Union lines. And he would get a pension for being a loyal Confederate soldier, despite not having served long enough, according to the law, despite being disqualified because he deserted, despite being disqualified because he took up arms against the Confederacy. I mean, he's disqualified, but he's remembered. And when he dies, how's he remembered? He's remembered as a Confederate and as a loyal Confederate. And so even pensions can be used as a form to attract former unionists or former dissenters, if you will, to the, uh, the lost cause. And so the lost cause is makes room for many people, uh, white people, I should say. Um, and in some cases, even some African-Americans and the book talks about that as well. Uh, but yeah, unionism, there's a whole memory of unionism that's been largely overlooked by scholars with a few exceptions, there are some scholars like John Insko who've looked at it, but there needs more work on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Sorry, <laughs> sounds getting a little weird. Um, and yeah, I mean, you talk quite a bit about the use of fraud um, potentially as a way of getting some political support in the South as well, right? With uh, giving out so many pensions to former Confederates as a means of kind yeah. of encouraging democratic voting patterns and things like that. It's overt. I mean, they literally bribe people. They literally have letters in the archives where somebody writes a government official and is like, uh, my pension got taken away. People called me a deserter or whatever, you know, or I made too much money depending on how he lost his pension. Um, I promise I'll vote Democratic if you give me my pension back. And on the top of the letter scrawled by a government official is write back, tell him he'd get his, his, his pension. It's like October 12th, you know, this letter is being being replied to saying we'll give you your pension because you know november is around the corner um and the guy gets his pension back sure enough you can actually track these guys losing their pensions when they're detected so every so often a deserter gets detected someone complains they lose their pension like within a year they get it back uh, it's not enforced because um ultimately as long as you're willing to toe the line on the lost cause it's it's a cheap way to um keep people politically loyal it's a form of spoils um and it's, it's also from the point of view of the government, right? If you're a county official, you're gonna have to take care of an, uh, uh, if you have someone who's really you know, poor, someone really poor off, who needs to be supported, they're elderly, you know, they're in their 80s uh, and can't take care of themselves. There's no welfare yet. There's no sort of safety net at all. And it's the county's responsibility to take care of unless you get this pension, right? So you, you have letters in there where you, know, you have, uh, People being like, oh, we don't know if this guy, what unit this guy was in, or really if we if he ever served, but but we really need this pension for him. Can we get him a pension? I mean, because it's it's a way of also providing welfare only to whites. And this is the sort of interesting thing. It's a form of providing welfare to elderly white men um, and elderly white women because their widows get it. Um, and then a very small select group of African Americans, um, literally tiny number, um, who serve their own purpose are able to often get a smaller amount of money, very small amount of money, um, if they promise, if they sort of promise to uh, support white supremacy is, is basically the, the gimmick. And so 
um, yeah, I mean, pensions are a tool of, of power because money is a tool of power. I noticed there's a question in here um, about philanthropy. Um, and uh, I was just sort of glanced at it. That Yeah, Card donated uh, lots of money to African-American um, schools. And he was even praised by uh, various uh, African-American intellectuals as being a friend of the neighbor of, of, the, of African-Americans. And here's the thing. The reason they were dependent upon his money, upon his de donations, was because of the policies he pushed that didn't fund African-American education. And for them to get that money required them to toe the racial line. And he would actually give speeches um, where he would say as much. He would basically say that Africa, to, to, at, to African American graduating classes, he got invited because he'd given all this money, right? He got to give this speech to them where he says, stop telling Northerners that you're being mistreated in the South or things will happen to you. As long as you don't do that though, you'll be okay. I mean, so he's using history as a threat um, frequently and he's using his money as a tool of power because in a capitalistic society, money is power. Um, and so the dependencies, yes, is he not as terrible as some of his contemporaries? No question. But he's definitely um, had no qualms about that violence. And that money was premised upon his requirements being met, right? And if you didn't meet those requirements, you don't get that money. And so the people who are praising him are frequently doing it because they have to praise him to get that money. Um, so take that praise with a grain of salt. I want to I want to hit on that taking things with a grain of salt train. Uh, <laughs> we've got a question about how you know, given cars, lies, exaggerations, fabrications about his service, how much can we really believe in what he says? So when he claims that he horsewhipped this woman in the streets, um, and does it even matter, you know, if he did um, not do it, so long as he's saying it? I mean, the fact that he's willing to brag about it, I think, is is telling, right? I think that's the first thing we have to say, um, right? It's definitely the case that we need to be clear on that. Um, there is evidence uh, that was discovered by uh, uh, Brian Fennessy, discovered evidence um, that the whipping did happen. Um, there is an account, um, it's in 1866 or seven though. Um, there was an account of the car boys, I think, if I remember the quote right, whipping, it's, it's like a hard document to find. It was in the National Archives, I think is where he found it. Um, there's a report though that uh, the car boys basically had assaulted someone. Um, and so there is an assault, whether that's the same assault and he's off on the date or it's a second assault is really the question I have because it could very well be a second assault. So do I think the assault happened? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I don't th think the assault is made up um, because there is that other document that we found from reconstruction. The question I have is, was it in 1865 like he claims? He claims it's in 65 or was it 66 or 67? It's an easy thing to misremember perhaps. Um, did he really sleep with a shotgun under his bed afterwards? I don't know, um, but probably not. Um, but uh, that's not a good safe way to sleep with a shotgun under your pillow. It ends bad. Um, don't do that. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, I think I think we can trust him that he really did solve it. But ultimately, I think yeah, we it almost doesn't matter because we know these assaults happened by other people, and he's celebrating them regardless of whether he did it or not. Absolutely. Um, and so thinking about these distortions and falsehoods that are common in war memories across wars and among all types of veterans, um, how do you reckon with things like the, the monuments being put up uh, to, to aim messages at other groups like white moderates, Republicans, Democrats, uh, and also thinking about putting waving the bloody shirt in conversation with the lost cause. Uh, how do you evaluate those kind of two different strains of memory coming out of this period? And, and how do we put them in conversation with one another? Yeah, I mean, there, there's pushback, right? I mean, I think this is really valuable. I and mean, when we talk about people often say, well, people don't know better. Or they didn't know it was a lie. I, I've gotten some pushback with people rejecting my argument that these are lies, that these are knowing lies and not just mistakes, right? And this is the same debate we have today when we talk about um, how the media deals with lies in politics. Do you say he's lying when the president of the United States lies or do you say he's mistaken? And that's a really important thing. And basically one of the ways you know it's a lie is that people keep telling him, hey, that's not true and he keeps saying it. 
right? So if you keep saying something when you, we've been told that it's not true, it's clear you know there's a counter narrative. And the same thing happens here. Julian Carr knows slavery is the cause of the war because he keeps telling people not to say slavery is the cause of the war, right? He knows somebody's pushing back and he knows it's important that people not toe that line. He knows the stakes. That's why he literally will say to an African-American audience, you know, buy into this narrative of history. And interestingly enough, when he's talking to different audiences, he'll hedge on the causes of the war. He'll actually sort of acknowledge slavery plays a role when he's talking to African-Americans um, because African-Americans um, would, if you look at the war from his perspective, right? African-Americans not running away when the war would determine their freedom and staying loyal as he sees it um, is all it makes Confederate soldiers all the more impressive. And it makes the Confederate all the more impressive if the war is about slavery. And so it's the one time he's okay talking about so they know it's a lie. And so you have these counter narratives and they're in conflict, right, frequently. And ultimately they find common ground at, at times, um, but it's messy when you have different narratives, right? And so you, you find this common ground and you know some people sort of see this as a reconciliation or a reunion at the expense of African-American memory. Um, and I think that's not inaccurate, uh, but it's also, um, and accepting of certain certain narratives that benefit both sides. So for instance, the aspect of the Confederate, if, if Confederate soldiers are the greatest soldiers ever, and you're a Union soldier, or a former Union soldier, having Confederate soldiers be some of the greatest soldiers ever is great because it means you fought better than the greatest soldiers ever, right? It makes you better. So if you have basically the two greatest sides ever fought each other is the story, you'll buy into that because it pumps you up as well. And so elements of the lost cause are designed to accept other people in um, and to be sold outward. It's not just for domestic consumption, it's to, for consumption uh, in the North, in the West and internationally. As I mentioned, you know, cars pushing this stuff out in Manila in the Philippines in 1916. And, and ultimately the lost cause memory is, is, it becomes heavily dominant in how we understand reconstruction for a long time and it's now been displaced at least academically, but there's still plenty of people who see Reconstruction um, as this, this great tragedy that it was instituted as opposed to a tra tragedy that it wasn't continued. Um, but it's used to justify things like um, apartheid in South Africa. When you look at the guys who are designing apartheid, one of the ways they justify it is, well, we can't do what they did in the South during Reconstruction or things will go bad. We can't give the vote to African-Americans. And so they're using this example. And so um, these myths, these memories, are definitely in conversation with other strands of memory. Does that answer the question? I'm not sure it does, but. I like that. <laughs> hey, you'll have your uh, your email ready and available for anybody who wants to ask further questions for sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, getting into that as well a little bit more. Um, somebody asked if you could speak a little bit more about how the lost cause turned the Civil War into a white man's war and subverted African-Americans part in fighting the war and how that played into white supremacy. Um, just how did that kind of, how did that transition happen where we have this 200,000 men strong force of African-Americans fighting for the war, really affecting victory towards the end years of the war itself. How did that change over time and become this kind of white supremacist memory of what the war was? Yeah, I mean, so African-Americans after the war, like, hey, there's a right side and a wrong side and this was a war about freedom. I mean, they're clear on what they want this war remembered as, um, at least some of them. You know, they're, they're literally, you know, Frederick Douglass is out there saying there's a right side and a wrong side. Um, and, and this memory of black male military service is supposed to convince people that, hey, we've earned the ballot. And they say that. You have African-Americans who are like, I've earned the ballot. I fought. Lincoln, in his last address before he dies, says... You know, he is he, he historically not been in favor of enfranchising African-Americans, but he says, you know, those who served should probably be enfranchised, um, essentially. So black military service is a key political tool and the memory of it. And so one of the reasons is it has to be forgotten. And this is why you won't find in the early uh, 20th century, you'll ne never find anyone claiming they're black Confederates in the early 20th century. You'll find lots of claims of loyal slaves because if black men could serve and could serve well as white men, then the argument that white men should be allowed to vote and black men shouldn't dies real fast. 
And so they erase um, African-American troops from the United States military um, in their memory of the war, largely. Um, the other sort of, um, so that, that I would say that they, they push back against it heavily and African-American memory pushes back um, stronger than any other form of memory against the lost cause. And, and you see African-Americans push back. That's where you get them. African-Americans have been objecting to the lost cause since it formed. In fact, um, Ethan Keitel and Blaine Roberts um, have said that the lost cause really starts as a counter narrative to African-American memory. And I think they're right. Um, is that you have this African-American memory and the lost cause counters it saying, no, you can't, uh, we don't wanna give you the vote. Um, and they, so this erasure is really interesting because one of the things that happens in this erasure is that it's accompanied at the same time by this myth of loyal slaves. And this myth of loyal slaves later gets remembered as black Confederates. And what you have in reality is you have African-Americans impressed to labor for the Confederacy. Um, and these documents are fascinating that you can find um, about this impressment. Uh, lots of them, lots of these impressed individuals run away um, and they, um, some people don't want to allow their enslaved people to be impressed, but they don't have a choice. They're forced to dig trenches basically or, or whatever other service they're put to, to labor for the Confederacy. They're not given arms. Um, they're not consider considered soldiers. It's very clear. And in the early 20th century, when they're given these pensions, they're being remembered as loyal slaves. And they'll say as much, these are not soldiers. They say in, the, in all the documents, these are not soldiers. These are slave pensions and the pensions are worthless. They don't transfer to the widows like, like a veteran's pension does. They're not authorized at the same time. They're authorized later. Um, and they're secondary. They don't get funded as much. So like if there's not enough money, they get cut first. I mean, it's very clear. These are second tier pensions. And these have become now remembered as black soldiers. These documents about these pensions are now remembered as black soldiers, but they weren't remembered as black soldiers when they got the pension. They weren't black soldiers, remembered as black soldiers when they were forced to labor. In many ways, they saw, many of them, I would argue, likely saw these pensions as an early form of reparations, back pay for the labor. In fact, one of them actually has a comment by the guy um, in his pension. He says, I worked for six months and I've never yet been paid. And that's why he's applying for his pension. All right, so he's like, I'm waiting for my back pay. Um, and so you can see these as, as an early form of, of reparations even, um, interestingly enough. But what's weird is that some of the pictures even of African-American troops from the Civil War have been reinterpreted inaccurately as pictures of black Confederates even. So you see a like 180 degree turn. You not only erase African-American troops, you create African-American Confederate troops as being tied to racism becomes unpopular. Really in, and um, uh, Kevin Levine has written an entire book on it. I've written two chapters on it, um, but um, I think the two books go together well, but they, they did not see themselves. In fact, those African-Americans who said, I was a soldier have their pensions rejected because they say, oh, you, you must be lying. Um, those African-Americans who say, I dug trenches loyally and stayed loyal to my master, um, they don't investigate even if they were, some of them were like four years old when the war ended. Um, and I'm pretty sure they didn't dig trenches as a four-year-old. Um, so, I mean, again, it's all about memory. It's not about reality. Uh, on that pensions question, there are a couple questions from people in the audience about how Confederate pensions were even paid for. What was mm -hmm. the source for those, for those sources for these things? So this is a really important thing because uh, federal pensions for the U.S. military, right, the Union, if you will, but I, I call it, they call it the U U.S. military, they were paid for by federal tax dollars. The U.S. government pays them. Confederate pensions are different. They're funded state by state. So every state has a different system. They're all slightly different. Um, they start at different times. They all tend to be around the same period. I mean, they're all within, you know, they all sort of expand in the early 20th century. I, I'm overgeneralizing a little bit here, but um, they, they're less than federal pensions uh, because they're paid by state tax dollars. There is this plan at one point to try to expand it uh, and, and try to get the federal government to pay it and they won't, they never do it. That there are no uh, Confederate soldier ever receives a pension from the US government. Um, 
by the time any authorized any laws are passed that authorize such pensions, all Confederate veterans are dead, and the only ones left are fake veterans. Um, and so there is no uh, Confederate pension ever paid by the, the federal government to a Confederate veteran. Um, but and then in many states, not all uh, widows are eligible. And exact eligibility varies again from state to state, whether you had to be disabled or not, and how much you got paid. Um, they had different amounts based on disability, right? If you're 100% disability, you get more money or less money, and it changes from year to year. Um, but it's, and only, I think it's five states, if I remember correctly, give pensions to formerly enslaved people who were for impressed laborers. Um, and, and all of them are later. And in some cases, they actually like backtrack from it because they're like, oh, we, we don't want to have to give that much money. Um, and so they, they actually like have debates about whether we should deauthorize it. So like South Carolina um, has too many applications and they're like, oh, that's too much for us to pay. So we're going to change the rules and make it more strict on who gets it. Um, so these pensions are, are state level. They're run by the state and um, then there are county boards that administer them. But they're minuscule compared to the federal pensions when you think about amounts of money, I mean, not minuscule, but significantly smaller. Yeah, great answer, thank you. Uh, we've also got a few questions about monuments throughout this period. Uh, one asking whether Civil War monuments in the North were being erected around the same time period as these Confederate monuments. Uh, if so, is this an attempt to counter Northern self-celebrations as well? Uh, and in uh, and another question is, um, can you compare the motive of Confederate monument building with those of Northern monument building? Yeah, um, so these are great questions. First off, Confederate, there are some Confederate monuments all over the world. I mean, you can find them. There are Confederate monuments in like California. Um, there's one in like LA, um, if I remember right. There was one in Boston, or there was, it's been removed now, that was the site of where prisoners are. So the ones in the North tend to be either at battlefields um, or, um, at former prison sites or in border states, places like Kentucky, right? Kentucky becomes, there's there's an old saying among Southern historians that Kentucky becomes, joins the Confederacy after the war ends uh, because you know two thirds of Kentuckians who serve in the war fight for the United States and one third fight for the Confederacy yet it's largely like if you go to their commemorative landscape it's far more Confederate, right? Because this is about, when we're talking about monuments you can, you can learn a lot from monuments about the period they're put up, but monuments don't teach you much about the thing they nominally commemorate, right? They teach you far more about the Jim Crow era than they teach you about the Civil War. Um, and frequently they're inaccurate, right? You see these monuments that say, you know, no nation rose so fair and white or fell so pure of crime. Um, and there's one of those 10 miles from Andersonville. I mean, wow, right? You know, 13,000, nearly 13,000 Americans die there and it's like, I'm not sure they rose so fair and white and fell so pure of crime when you're that close to Andersonville is a real interesting statement. And I think it's on purpose, right? It's pushing back, right? Again, you have this conflict between narratives of, of the war, but um, the monuments put up in the North largely um, were aimed at specific sort of sites, right? They're not more general, usually at least the ones I know of. Um, I don't study Union monuments or monuments up North. There are people who do um, but I would say that um, a few things to remember, um, those monuments are, monuments can serve multiple purposes at some time. Monuments can both memorialize the dead and be used to celebrate white supremacy. They're not mutually uh, exclusive. Um, in fact, monuments serve different purposes for different groups. Uh, and, and symbols gain meanings, they rarely lose meanings, right? It's hard to wash a symbol of meaning, right? When someone flies a Confederate flag, it's not an unfair assumption to go, eh, that, especially if you're African-American, I don't know if I wanna like go up to that, that guy and talk to him and ask him about why he's flying a Confederate flag because it might be that he's racist because that flag has ties to racism. Whether the guy means it to mean that or not, it's a symbol. Symbols by their very nature are not direct, they are symbolic, right? And so you're interpreting these things, same with monuments. When you're dealing with these monuments, they can mean multiple things at multiple times. Um, and so they're pushing the lost cause memory, no question, up north um, when they're putting these monuments up. There's a series of monuments around Gettysburg that are devoted to who went farthest. 
um, this is one of my favorite sets of monuments is there's two different monuments, one put up by Virginians and one put up by North Carolinians, both claiming to be the farthest point in Pickett's Charge. Um, what exactly furthest means, I still have yet to get a good answer on. Um, and you ask any military historian, they're like, I don't know what you're talking about, right? Furthest isn't really a meaning. Is it furthest to, to the east, furthest into the enemy lines, furthest uh, marched? It, it's this vague term, but whoever went furthest was the bravest, so they all want this claim. Um, and so these monuments are often about um, claiming valor um, and especially these, these ones about the high watermark of the Confederacy um, are just sort of fascinating to me uh, in the way that they portend to be historical marking, but they're really about proving that one state or the other fought better. Um, and so, and I think it's worth remembering that monuments put up by the union have multiple meaning, meanings as well. And who was involved in this creation? Who was included? I'll give you an example. Um, there's a monument in um, uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts that has one of my ancestors on it. Um, he, he died, so the monument. Um, and, and it's like, that's cool, right? It's, it's this cool monument to my ancestor and um, it has all the veterans who died from Pittsfield, except African-Americans from Pittsfield who died are not included. Um, they're left off. <clears throat> and we know there are members of the 54th Massachusetts who died from Pittsfield, right? So these monuments are not without their own entanglements in how they're shaping memory. When they put forward, here are the people of Pittsfield who fought for the United States, they are excluding people. Um, and so I think it's, 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 these things are complex. They're not easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of overlap and in, in interest convergence, it seems, among these groups and how they use memory and commemoration. Uh, all right, we've, we've got a lot of questions, so I'm going to try to get to some of them uh, as we're wrapping up. Uh, some really good ones here. Let's see. Um, somebody was asking about uh, commemorative groups like the UDC and the SCV in this modern context, um, and how do we do you see them as benign historical honoring ancestors or are they only existing as ways to continue to promote white supremacy? I mean, how do we reckon with these you know, commemorative groups uh, in, in this modern period? Yeah, so the United Confederate Veterans and the Confederate Veterans are, are problematic organizations, obviously, historically. Um, and, and, you know, I think people join them often for very sincere and reasons, right? Like, I want to know more about my ancestor. This is a way to find out more about my ancestor. Um, you know, I am um, I understand that as a historian. I want to know more about my ancestors, right? I mean, it's cool. Um, there's a difference between, though, as a historian, I would say, between celebrating our ancestors and studying our ancestors. Um, and, and a lot of times people are, are hesitant to find out facts about their ancestors that aren't so happy. Like, give you an example. I, I once uh, helped a gentleman who was doing some genealogical research, um, and I won't say his name, but uh, I, I, you know, I found his ancestor, and his ancestor was in the brig of a, a U.S. Navy ship repeatedly because he was drunk, um, and it's like he suddenly was less interested in the research I was providing him about his ancestor when he found out his ancestor was not this naval hero, but actually in the brig because he was kept being repeatedly had been um, in trouble for being drunk, right? People don't want to know the bad parts. Um, and so I think the problem that these organizations often face is, is twofold. One is their historical legacy, um, is that these they have been tied to white supremacy since they're founded. Um, and it wasn't an accident. It, they, they were open about this, that this was about white supremacy. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, people have talked about how, you know, the Sons of Confederate Veterans in recent years or the last 30 years have been taken over by white supremacists. And there's these, these conversations about sort of battles for control of these organizations in the modern era. Um, but these organizations had historically been controlled by white supremacists and individuals in the you know, 80s and 90s had tried to move them away from their white supremacist roots um, and they're moving perhaps back. Um, but I think the sort of unquestioning belief in heroes um, and the unwillingness to think critically about our ancestors is inherently problematic because what it says 
um, and the obsession with owning the past, because these monuments present an exclusionary memory, right? If this is a, they're trying to erase my history, but these monuments are already erasing someone else's history because they're not inclusive of the entire story. They're only telling part of the story. Um, and so it's, it's an inheritance in many ways. And, and so I, I, I personally do not belong to any of these organizations, um, obviously. Um, and they, um, but they are, they are problematic organizations because they still push narratives that are used to uphold white supremacy today and justify white supremacy today. Whether knowingly or unknowingly, they are pushing a narrative that allows a white supremacist view of the world today. And that's a problem. Um, because A, it's ahistorical, and B, it's justifying white supremacy. Um, and so um, I do see these organizations as really problematic, but I think they've always been problematic um, for a variety of reasons. I don't know if that's a good answer, but it's an answer, I guess. Uh, that's the best we can do sometimes, right? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, all right. Well, I'll end on one last question then. Um, and I think that kind of fits into what you were just talking about. Uh, is Do you think that there were a few, you know, quote unquote, legendary Confederate commanders' reputations like uh, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, Jeb Stewart, uh, who've become generalized in uplifting the view of Confederate soldiers as part of this lost cause memory. Uh, like you said, kind of this hero connection. Can you say that one more time? Uh, right. This kind of heroic connection, per, you know, connecting general soldiers to, to the, right. the reputations of these great generals. Yeah, I mean, the generals are, um, are, clearly, are clearly become examples. Right, they become sort of the exemplars, um, and they're part of the lost cause, um, and and they're key to the lost cause. Robert E. Lee becomes the saint of the Confederacy, the patron saint, you could argue of, of the, and there's plenty of lies about him. You could write an entire book um, about the lies around Robert E. Lee, um, and there's some great books that debunk a lot of these lies. For instance, uh, Reading the Man and uh, The Making of Robert E. Lee are two books that do an excellent job of this for those looking for more reading but um yeah the confet the sort of her creating these heroes out of generals is a parallel to creating this hero of the common soldier right you have these common soldier monuments that are the sort of uh stand in for all confederates and then you have these monuments to robert e lee stonewall jackson and they're remembered as the world's greatest generals right and there is a problem with that memory in my mind. And that is that um, it's it's uncritical. It's just not critical of the fact that for starters, they lost. Um, like, let's start with that issue that like, we don't really always talk about um, the fact that the Confederacy loses. That's one aspect of the lost cause that I think people forget um, is how much it sort of shifts our understanding. Um, but but yeah, I think that the generals are a fundamental part of remembering Confederates. The soldiers are the Spartans and, you know, Lee is their leader, just like, um, I'm forgetting the Spartan general's name now that I'm on the spot, um, but um, is it Leonidas, um, um, I, I forget which which general it is, but anyways, um, I'm not a classicist, uh, but they, they're always, you know, sort of comparing them. And so celebrating Robert E. Lee as the perfect Southern gentleman is part of the lost cause in the same way that remembering Confederate soldiers is the greatest soldiers ever was. And they come together because it's, it helps explain loss, right? They were too, you have the, the old joke, you know, Robert E. Lee didn't surrender. Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, Ulysses S. Grant just took his sword and he was too much of a gentleman to ask for it back. Um, is, is like a joke I heard growing up. It's a terrible joke um, that Robert E. Lee didn't surrender. He just had his sword stolen. It, it's silly, but it's it's this sort of joke that allows you to um, see the Confederates as superior. They had superior gentlemen uh, as their commanders, um, despite the fact that, let's be clear, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson committed treason per se. Like treason is outlined in the US Constitution. It's very clear on what what it qualifies as treason. Taking up arms against the United States government is treason. That, that's what it's called. Um, 
this is not me being political. This is just what the Constitution says. Um, they took an oath to the U.S. Constitution, right? They took an oath to the United States when they were at West Point, um, and, and they broke that oath. Um, now, you can say, oh, they resigned, but oaths don't usually end with a resignation. Um, but regardless, um, you know, they, that aspect of them is erased in the same way that Robert E. Lee being remembered as kind to enslaved people, despite the fact being remembered by enslaved people as a terrible master who was horrible um, and who separated families. And, and we look at the documents, it turns out Robert E. Lee was very much an advocate for slavery and very much um, tried to maintain enslaved people himself. Um, and so this, this rewriting, these lies, they apply not only to the big picture, but the small picture. And these tiny lies build up to create the bigger lie of the lost cause, or as I call it, the false cause, um, which then build up, hold up the biggest lie of all, which is um, white supremacy. Um, and so that's sort of the structure of, of how these lies work. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we've reached the end of our time here, so I'll just wrap things up with us here tonight. But thank you so much for being here. Dr. Dombey was really fascinating. And uh, I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions. We had quite a few coming in there towards the end. So thank you, everybody, for your interest. Uh, please feel free to forward your questions that we didn't get to to Dr. Dombey, to myself, Dr. Quigley. Uh, we'll be happy to engage with you moving forward. This will also be posted uh, on C-SPAN and the v CCWS YouTube website. So keep an eye out uh, and we'll keep you all informed. But with that, I want to say thank you so much again. Uh, appreciate having you here tonight, Dr. Dombey. And thank you everyone for being here as well. And we'll see you all soon come spring. <laughs>